Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is Josh Jacobs from the LGO Program Office. I'm very happy to welcome you to this week edition of our web seminar. Uh, we're very pleased to have Victoria de Mateis, who's LGO graduate from 2002, and she'll be talking today about her experiences at Boeing. Uh, just briefly about Victoria's background, um, she is currently the Senior Manager for 747 Airframe Engineering, and she'll explain uh, more details about that current role. Um, going back into the last 10 years at Boeing, she's had a variety of responsibilities, including uh, working on the 777 program, manufacturing lean group, um, 777 installation, uh, job in commercial aviation services, where she provided technical support to Latin American airline uh, operators of 777s and other era aircraft. Um, really, a whole a whole variety of roles, and I think she'll she's really the best person to address that as part of her uh, navigation theme. Um, Victoria is a native of Mexico. She is a graduate of CETIS Universidad in Baja California uh, and previously worked in Mexico for Honeywell, uh, formerly Allied Signal, uh, which is actually a pretty distinguished path for other LGO grads uh, like our uh, board co-chair Jeff Wilkie, who's another Allied Signal guy. Um, Victoria just last year was in the news. She won the ENOC Luminaries Award, which recognizes Hispanic professionals in engineering and science fields. Um, and Victoria lives in Seattle, and uh, I think I'll just turn it over to her. So Victoria, please take it away. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, good morning, everybody here in the uh, uh, West Coast, and a good afternoon for the East Coast. Um, thank you very much uh, again for joining us today. And as I just mentioned, I'm an LGO from 2002, and I'm here to talk about my career progression as I graduated from LGO. Okay, let's talk about the agenda for today. Uh, so in an effort to make it more entertaining and uh, more memorable, I'm planning to use um, metaphors related to aviation and airplane flight, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, here we go, the plan for today, it's, it's uh, my, talking about my flight path and relevant learning experiences in my departure from LGO. So I will talk about that flight plan, uh, but part of that flight plan is to um, be able to recognize some uh, leadership attributes and uh, I'll, I'll pick these uh, attributes listed in here. Uh, I want to talk about rotational programs, technical leadership, business environment, uh, what is the leadership style in a, a woman's perspective, talk about diversity a little bit, career management, and what is the LGO factor, or uh, I want to talk about, you know, if it was worth to spend the time and money and uh, LGO, okay? All right, uh, in order to set up some context, um, after a graduation from uh, LGO, the only, uh, the only company I have worked for is the Boeing company. Nonetheless, uh, it's such a big uh, corporation. So it is basically the largest aerospace company in the world as of today. And um, so changing, uh, changing assignments or uh, taking different jobs in the company, it's, it's really like moving to a different <laughs> company. It's, uh, and it's, uh, with uh, all the you know different products and organizational structures that we have, it's 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 really I mean even though it's just one company, it's actually a myriad of experiences. So as you know, we design, assemble, and support commercial jetliners. We have our uh, uh, seven series uh, commercial airplanes: the 737, 747, 67, and 777. And um, it, it is true that we are the performance. Yeah, for defense systems, our main products are military transport, tankers, fighters, and helicopters, and support systems. And we're also in the business of, of providing uh, financial solutions. And also, uh, we, are, uh, we focused on seeing what's the future for our customer, uh, proposing new advanced systems and technology to meet future, uh, to meet future demands. Okay. Why it's a Concorde uh, in this presentation? I mean, it's obviously not a Boeing product, as you may know. But uh, what I wanted to uh, use this image is to portray my passion for aviation. Um, 
that is the reason why I'm in this mission and I chart my course working for uh, for the Boeing company. Uh, since I was a kid, I uh, share the passion for aviation with my dad. So uh, the reason I'm putting the Concorde is because when I was a kid, uh, we used to go to the uh, Mexico City International Airport at least uh, um, once a month to see the Concorde arrive. And, um, and I don't know if it's in my DNA or if it's, if it's an acquired trait, but uh, every time I see a commercial or print trans transport, uh, it, it is something that it ignites my passion, and, uh, and um, that's why I'm still here. Okay, so um, now I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, explain to more detail my career path. So the main areas that I have worked for is uh, manufacturing, engineering, and uh, uh, some customer service, um, um, smaller assignment. But uh, while working in such a complex and big organization, I have had also the opportunity to uh, touch other organizations and somehow and learn a lot about uh, their processes. So this would be like supplier management, manufacturing, research and development, and I think uh, sales and marketing and other groups were also uh, have been areas that I have uh, touched as I go through my career. So if we start from the bottom, um, one of the uh, strong uh, reasons why I joined the Boeing Company upon graduation is because I also did my internship in the uh, 717 program at Boeing uh, when the program was located in uh, Long Beach. And um, I had the opportunity there to uh, perform uh, economical analysis and do some some sort of uh, eye work developing a critical path for the 717 moving line. And uh, I made sure I did a very good job on, on, on that assignment because it was 2002 and uh, I love, uh, I, I, know I have the passion for aviation, but I also knew that the, the job market wasn't very good and I needed to secure an, an offer and I did. And, um, and my offer was uh, to work in uh, Puget Sound, obviously, because that's where the business was growing at that particular moment of time, and it keeps growing. So uh, I joined the uh, 777 uh, program so in the manufacturing group, and my role was as a lean consultant. And I performed similar assignments like in the 717 and um, ran some economical analysis and and also a lot of the work was related to um, understanding what is the work statement, how it's balanced across the different shops in Final Assembly 777, and what can we do to improve flow, flow and also to uh, increase uh, rate capability. So after uh, a year working as a lean consultant, I had a chance to move uh, uh, in a position as a factory supervisor. And one of the reasons I picked it is because I also uh, listened to the advice uh, that I received from many um, LGO peers. Uh, so while I was doing my interviews to join the Boeing company and talking to other uh, Boeing LGO peers, they always recommended me to start um, uh, at the end of the value flow to, uh, to pay your dues working in manufacturing for a while. So we can really understand uh, where the rubber hits, hits the road so basically, uh, if whatever other functions that we work later on our careers are going, we need to make sure we understand how does that impact the final product, which is basically what our customers receive. So taking into that advice, um, I joined uh, 777 Manufacturing, and uh, it was a very, very interesting time. Um, we were still in the downturn uh, time, but uh, um, I basically, um, Learn a lot about leadership. Learn a lot about working with unionized, unionized employees. How uh, understanding how to negotiate, understand their uh, their culture, and uh, how to uh, work together. And there was a lot of challenges at the beginning because um, uh, that the, that sh the shop at the, uh, the particular moment of time, the first shop I worked for, uh, which was the cargo closures in final assembly. Uh, let me explain a little bit more what cargo closures means. It's uh, basically we are responsible to make sure all the systems in the cargo compartments are um, are properly installed, and we're responsible to call uh, the customer representatives to review the areas and make sure that they agree that we are to close those areas so the compartment, uh, uh, the cargo compartments are ready for um, for delivery. And uh, so during that time, uh, there was not as much diversity, and it was very unusual to have somebody that it's 
coming from a different country, different background, or women uh, to work with unionized employees. And um, so uh, basically the big lesson learned for me was that, yeah, sometimes there's going to be an immune system that is trying to push you out because you are, you are different, you know, and it's uh, normal human nature. So let's try, I just try to come to terms to that and understand why, you know, the reactions are the way they are and then focus more on uh, helping them, making sure that our team had the help that they needed to be successful and uh, be resilient in regards to comments or some people would not like, um, you know, me wearing like an MIT shirt or something like that. But uh, um, uh, then once they get to know me and get to understand that I'm there to help, that I'm not just doing a rotation without no intentions to help others or uh, help the organization to succeed, things got significantly better. So from that first job, then I had an opportunity to do uh, uh, some time do doing uh, the uh, supporting the doors crew and then another time supporting the uh, upper deck, the main deck installations. And then I, my final job was in a um, systems installation for the cargo compartment again. In this case, it was not the closures, but installing the systems itself. A very complex job, one of the most complex, complex shops in, uh, in the 777 factory. And I, and I may say that I technically, obviously, was very successful, but I was also very successful on developing, you know, um, a voice and developing a, a, a good leadership style working with, uh, with my peers. I mean, with, and with the unionized employees. Then the next assignment uh, I took was in, uh, in CAS. Uh, what is CAS? CAS is Commercial Aviation Services, which is a customer service unit for Boeing. And um, there was two elements on this decision. The first one is that uh, my, uh, my highest desire uh, was to uh, have an assignment in engineering, but at that particular moment of, of time, I didn't have uh, my green card or my um, uh, U.S. citizenship status, and it is a requirement to be an engineering manager. So that was not an option, but I was working on it. And uh, then learn, uh, through my uh, LGO peer network, I learned about a potential assignment as an individual contributor for a while uh, in, the, uh, in the customer service unit. And they, I was advised that it was a very good opportunity because you get to understand, not, I mean, I have already done the um, final assembly, which is kind of at the end of the value stream, but this is really at the end of the value stream, working with the customer and also understanding how do we support those airplanes after we deliver them. Um, it was a great experience and a very good cultural fit, too, because I had assigned to the um, Latin American operators, so in Latin America, uh, and this is, uh, and my responsibility was for wide bodies, so it was just the products uh, that have a single, I, I'm, I'm sorry, a, a double life, it will be 777, 67, and 747. But in reality, in Latin America, the, 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 the biggest player on the fleet is the 767 right now. 777s are growing, but at that moment of time, my focus was more like in 767. And so I had an opportunity to um, learn a lot about how Boeing interacts, helps, supports the uh, our airplane fleet, and then I also had a chance to travel a lot, which was awesome. I got to go to Rio de Janeiro and Chile, multiple times to Mexico, and it was very neat to be able to work with the Mexican airlines and, uh, and being able to support them in their own language. Okay, so uh, then, uh, then I got my green card, yay. So I had the, uh, the opportunity to uh, apply for an engineering job, and uh, <clears throat> I was, uh, I was, I am actually very grateful for getting the opportunity from Boeing Engineering to, to jump into this role uh, directly as a manager because traditionally, and it is understandable, um, managing the engineering work is very complex or product is very complex. So they, there's typically an expectation of some seniority, um, some uh, number of years uh, to be able to jump from uh, the engineering to the engineering management ranks. So I was given the opportunity, and I was also given an opportunity that was uh, manageable uh, because uh, I had the uh, responsibility for 777 airframe, airframe um, uh, aft fuselage. So this is the, the, the aft portion of the fuselage in uh, the 777. And um, during that time when I joined the group, we had both uh, product development and also 
uh, work statement on that on that particular group. And I was assigned the sustaining work statement, which is great because it is a stable work statement. It is it is about supporting the factories and the suppliers, and uh, so that being in a sustaining job really helped me to understand what are all, what are all the different types of work statement that we can do. While product development, it's also a very good experience, but it's more focused on developing the new designs, and it, 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 it is just one area. So I, I work uh, with the 777 uh, for about two years, and, uh, and it was a great time because a lot of the time was spent on improving processes, making our um, engineering processes for developing drawings and engineering information more efficient. Um, but also had a very good element of manufacturing engineering into it. Um, we work uh, during the implementation of the 777 freighter. We had the opportunity to uh, implement the new processes for, for related to the aft cargo door, which was a new uh, new feature on the on the Boeing product. So we developed a new control code and we stabilize it and get it uh, get it healthy into production. So that required working very close with uh, manufacturing research and development because we needed to implement new technologies and better tools to, to improve our manufacturing system. Another important project that I worked uh, with uh, manufacturing research and development was the implementation of uh, automated technologies on the, on the shop floor. Yeah. So um, after, again, after being two, being two years uh, working as a factory, uh, as an engineering supervisor, uh, and because we had a lot of successes on uh, on that time, I decided, well, let's uh, take advantage of the opportunity and apply for a senior manager job. And uh, yeah, and I was uh, I applied for a job in what we call here in uh, Boeing Puget Sound the IRC, which is the Interior Responsibility Center. So that is uh, a unit that is considered like a Boeing internal supplier that has their own engineering responsibility. So and their engineering responsibility is related to details and sub-assemblies. And then we have other engineering uh, unit in, at Boeing uh, that is called programs, which is in, in charge of the installation of those uh, subcomponents in the airplane. So I had responsibility for, uh, for interiors and particularly for the 747-8 program, which was awesome because it, was, it is the biggest uh, uh, commercial airplane interiors package ever built. So it, it came with a lot of learnings, and uh, I did that assignment for about a year and a half. And and, and then, as a senior manager, I transitioned back to um, structures. And uh, I'm going to explain in a in a further slide why of the why of this uh, transition uh, back to airframe. And um, I've been doing this job for a year and a half, and I have responsibility now again for fuselage, but in this case is the 747-8 uh, intercontinental and freighter. Uh, it is the forward section and the aft section of the airplane. Yeah, and it's a very interesting job because particularly the forward section of the airplane, as you know, we have the double deck and it has very complex contours and very uh, unique challenges compared to uh, all round airplanes. Okay, so this is the trajectory and you can see, uh, I also wanted to represent, you know, the, face, the faces of the flight, and I believe that uh, through all this time, um, I've been uh, kind of between takeoff and climbing, and uh, I consider cruising when we get to the point of getting into a leadership role like a director and executive. It's not cruising itself, that it's um, just having, you know, a good time. It's cruising in regards to we, we have got uh, to the level that, uh, um, uh, you know, the LGO, um, uh, education it's it's you know intended to bring us to all right so now let's uh, now that I have established the context the, the context of my um, uh, career path let's talk about rotational programs um, somehow rotational programs are like a taxing flight phase um, for Boeing, and uh, I could stand corrected because I, um, this is uh, my experience and I, you know, the um, LGO rotation programs at Boeing continue to evolve, but what I understand is that it's about six years of duration, and that was uh, pretty much uh, uh, my case. And 
So this is a, an opportunity that is invaluable. Um, I know of cases of other rotational programs in the Boeing company that are also very effective and very good, but the opportunities are, uh, are limited. So um, uh, having the ability to, uh, to move around the company with, uh, with help from our leadership, it's, it's great. And, uh, and with that great uh, opportunity, it also comes a great responsibility. We need to make sure we do the best on uh, taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, so there's two elements of the rotational program that I want to highlight, which are the mentoring and the rotational assignment. Um, mentoring, it was, uh, the highlight for me was the wonderful people I, um, I interacted with as mentors. I had two mentors, and I think part of the, 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 uh, the rotational program includes also rotation on the mentors. So uh, I had Ross Vogue to be my mentor for four years, and uh, Sandy Posto uh, for uh, two years. So Ross Vogue is the uh, uh, VP, the Vice President for Fabrication uh, in Boeing Commercial Airplanes. And Sandy Postel, she already retired, but she she uh, used to be the Vice President for Quality on, um, on uh, Manufacturing Processes. And so uh, meeting with them, it was always a milestone for um, for my uh, my month, I may say. Uh, when I when I met with Rob, uh, with Ross Vogue, I, uh, I had an opportunity to learn from him about the high level, how, how the leaders um, see the company. And um, one of the elements that I enjoy very much from him is, was his inspirational style. Every time I meet with him, I will, I will, I will understand more about the, the inspirational language and uh, how every time I will leave the, the, the meeting, I'll be, my spirit will be uplift, uplifted. Um, and I would be proud of working for the company. But also, I mean, in the practical side, he helped me a lot to uh, uh, identify what are the next assignments that I wanted to work with and uh, talk to the right people and in the organization to make it happen. With Sandy, uh, our conversations were more focused on uh, uh, making sure that I had a good understanding of the value chain. And she was also a very big champion for diversity, so I had the opportunity to learn from her. And as part of the opportunity, I mean, we have the two people I mentioned are, are um, the mentors that are in somewhat part of the process. They are assigned, but uh, also the, the doors are open from anybody in the community to, uh, to become a mentor for you. So I had as many mentors as, as I could. I had a lot of mentors that were like ex-bosses or other um, LGO peers that are in, 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 in higher positions of authority. Yeah, and so it's 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 very safe to ask for help, and in, and uh, and again, I cannot emphasize more how important uh, this has been for my career development. Then, rotational assignments. Yeah, in these six years, as you saw, I have multiple uh, multiple roles, and one of the things I really appreciate from the program is that it's non-prescriptive. Um, we don't have. We are highly recommended. We get recommendations to to do. Um, specific roles and we get advice, but uh, at the end, it is a match between what are our career interests or passion, and also, I mean, it's, it, it is a following advice, right? Okay. And um, All right, and now I want to switch gears to talk about technical leadership. And uh, again, I'm making an analogy to um, the aviation uh, industry. Uh, this is, uh, I have developed uh, what I call a pre-flight checklist uh, for, uh, to help me uh, be an effective le leader in the technical environment. So um, basically, uh, I think it's very easy for us to understand that it, we are uh, dealing with a very, very complex product. There's millions of parts, like six millions of parts specifically for the 747, and there's thousands and thousands of interconnected, intercon interconnected systems. I thought I say it right. And so that requires large and complex organizations and interactions. So uh, for us, it's very important to be learning as fast as we can. So accelerated accelerate learning is imperative. 
so we can have a very good level, uh, proficient level of management and leadership. Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the, uh, in the, talking about appreciating the past and improving the future, this comment in here, what it means is that uh, one of the things I've learned is that uh, when I'm joining all these complex groups, it is as important uh, to question, it is very important to question the status quo, it's like, well, uh, why are we doing what we're doing, we could improve, but it's also very important to understand uh, the story behind where we are today. Uh, um, that really helps us to uh, understand what is the culture that is in place, show some respect on, uh, you know, there's uh, 60 years of, uh, of uh, organization story and there's a reason why they start the, the way they are. And, um, and then that really helped me with that information, understand uh, um, the culture and be very mindful on my approach to change. Um, when it comes to uh, being a leader in engineering, my third bullet talks about skill management is half the job or more. Um, well, so basically the story goes that uh, in all the assignments that I have had as a senior manager, I think a uh, big pro uh, percentage of the, uh, of the time is devoted to understanding, you know, do we have the right skills and, and uh, our internal and external organizations evolve uh, how do we support those changes and how do we make sure we have our critical skills uh, maintained in place to, to be successful? So we spend a lot of time on, on doing that, uh, especially right now we have the right problem, which is we have too much work. And uh, so uh, if you decide to join the ranks of a company like Boeing, uh, expect in, your, in a leadership level to spend a lot of time on the people side uh, and, uh, in addition to the technical side. And uh, again, uh, following the, the, the theme of uh, being a very complex organization, um, one of the things that I have uh, learned is uh, to master the art of deciding when to stop asking for a lot of data and when to make a decision. Um, uh, well, I forgot to mention before that another important aspect is that uh, we need to have, um, we need to identify early our advisors and that technical people that can help us do the job as leaders because we have a, a unique situation as LGO in the Boeing company in which we don't have probably that deeper technical knowledge of it, but, uh, but we, understand systemic, we understand systemically how to, how to improve processes. And so as we identify all these uh, advisors, we use those advisors and, and uh, we make decisions on uh, collect, continue to collect data or uh, or uh, make a decision. Um, in my experience, I have to trust sometimes on my intuition very often and, uh, and, and move forward with a decision because it's a very complex environment and we can just spin our wheels. Um, so it's, it's something to expect as working in a, in a big company like Boeing. Another element that are important of technical leadership uh, are a discipline and a risk and opportunity identification uh, we put together plans, and in order to execute them, we also need to do uh, our homework of understanding for that plan, what are the true risks, and also identify, well, maybe there's opportunities, there's, uh, uh, there's, there could be some, uh, um, when I say opportunities, is the ability to identify that maybe we don't need as much resources as the original plan says because we are hedging for, um, um, for success. So um, it is very important to have fisc uh, fiscal discipline on that. And uh, working also in an uh, engineering environment in which we have uh, uh, our installations performing uh, outside suppliers, it's very important to understand the dynamics of the suppliers, uh, not only the technical side, but also the business side, uh, because that um, uh, even our technical solutions can, can be impacted by the economics or the, um, the situation with the suppliers. So, I, I am the focal for uh, one of our major suppliers in, in my 747 the Shade Airframe Group, and I spend a great deal of the time understanding how the supplier is doing uh, economically and schedule-wise to be able to also negotiate uh, the engineering requirements, new engineering requirements that we set up on them, um, and make sure that uh, those new requirements are, they, they are able to execute them. 
Okay, now I uh, would like to talk about the business environment. Uh, so uh, business environment, since I joined in 2002, there's been so many changes. As I mentioned before, uh, when I started working um, in 2002, there was one year just after 9-11, and um, I already mentioned an example in regards to being, in, uh, you know, challenges to get included in the organization and working with the union. Um, one element that I observed at that time and that has changed that has changed uh, drastically, and, and I don't I don't know if it's an issue for Boeing per se, but it could be an issue for other companies as they're going to downturns is uh, diversity dilution, because our uh, diverse population tends to be it, it tended to be at that time uh, of young, of uh, uh, shorter seniority and. Uh, and when I joined the company, it was not as diverse. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to say today that it, it is the opposite. Um, we have a lot of, uh, um, uh, we, we have hired uh, so many new employees coming from some, so many different places, um, particularly uh, very involved in the hiring for Hispanic in, uh, engineers. And I participate on uh, hiring events on the, all those different conferences that are um, imparted and so we make sure we uh, we have the right uh, um, diversity mix in the company um, and but during a downturn um, I, it could be a tough time but it's also a great time because everybody's talking everybody it's uh, uh, there's a lot of discussions about uh, how to improve and it was a uh, wonderful time to learn more about you know, how the company works what are the challenges and on the other side, it's a great opportunity uh, for us to, um, it's great information for, for me, uh, so in the future I can really appreciate the upturns. Um, right now, uh, this past week was particularly um, uh, good for the Boeing company in regards to orders. We got the biggest order ever for 777s and also for 737s. And I think if I didn't have uh, the opportunity to experience the downturn, I wouldn't be as uh, enthusiastic and excited about the, the prospects of the company so, uh, at this point. Okay, so having an upturn. An upturn is an opportunity because uh, there's also a lot of resources, so uh, it is a great time to make sure our teams and ourselves get as much uh, uh, training, you know, external and internal, and also providing challenging assignments to, to our teams to make sure they grow technically. And, and obviously, uh, there's a lot of new employees coming in. Um, right now, I have about eight new employees that I um, sit down with in a regular basis, and it, it, it is just, it is a wonderful time for that. And when it comes to our careers, obviously the organizational the organization is growing, so there's more opportunities that, that are being uh, more uh, uh, open positions that uh, are uh, identified across the company. And um, so, and, and as part of that, uh, the, the benefit of having more opportunities, it's also our, um, it's also very good, and I recommend that um, you get to understand how the, organiza the organization is evolving and what are the particular areas that are uh, that are having the growth. So you can identify potential career moves. So uh, a good example of uh, understanding how the, uh, the organization evolves would be um, in our engineering world here at Boeing, when I joined in 2002, um, the Boeing company was uh, the engineering, uh, the engineering uh, leadership was consolidating and what they called Big E. So we had all the engineering disciplines, design engineering, stress engineering, and ME engineering consolidated in one, in one group. So the first line managers or the supervisors for engineering will have those three functions. And while in a downturn that worked well uh, because it will be a more efficient use of resources, right now in an upturn we have so much work that uh, it, it became uh, a little bit too complex for a first-line manager to manage all those skills. So now, as we are in the upturn, the organization is evolving and becoming, and the mechanical engineering skill is becoming more um, um, 
more uh, independent, more functionally oriented, and also the, the, the opportunities for leadership are growing in that side. So it's something to consider. Okay, and uh, it is always good to be a little, uh, to have a little bit of paranoia. So I'm a little bit of a paranoid. So I'm always expecting the best, but I'm also preparing for the next challenge. Okay. So women in leadership. So we have female pilots on board. So what does that mean uh, for me? Um, I've been in the in corporate America for nine years, and I can humbly admit that I'm still learning a lot about the culture in the workplace. Um, I worked in Mexico before for six years, and it was mentioned for basically a light signal. And while the corporate culture is quite similar because it was an American subsidiary, there is some difference too, and uh, it's been my task to learn as much as I can on what works and what doesn't work for me, what are the gaps that I, I need to um, be aware and mindful and make sure that um, I use that in my advantage for my career. And um, so for I would like to use an example um, in regards to, you know, continuous learning on, on diversity for me. Um, and, uh, not diversity, I mean gender differences. Um, recently I had the opportunity to uh, uh, be one of the members of the engineering leadership program. And every year the Boeing company um, imparts this class. It's a class of about 45 uh, senior managers. And uh, we all have the chance to um, uh, to have multiple training in a period of six months. And we also work in a simulation project and a final project. And uh, what, we had a class on gender differences. And it was very interesting. Uh, the learnings that I had, that I thought I had it all figured out, and there's uh, some differences uh, in, you know, the way the uh, male, American male in, uh, mainstream Caucasian uh, interact with each other I wasn't aware. And uh, like, for example, I learned that sometimes, I mean, there's, you cannot generalize, right? But it's, it's very common that uh, an American male will be listening to you and they will not be looking at you directly. And um, some Sometimes I would think that it was, uh, for me, it was a sign of, well, they're not interested in what I'm saying, and it's not the case. So uh, learning about those little tidbits of culture really helped me to remove the noise of, oh, is this right? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And, uh, and then remove that noise and uh, help me focus on, you know, the real technical decision making. Um, yeah, and so there's, there's many things to learn. And uh, uh, I don't want to convey a message that I, have to change who I am to completely adapt to the mainstream culture, but I certainly sometimes have to come to terms with things uh, that um, are not going to help me in my career and, uh, and uh, come to terms to it and do a slight change without losing my essence. So, and so a lot of uh, my uh, work has been, you know, my learnings have been through observation, but again, I, I, I want to emphasize how important training and literature also can be for, for learning more about the culture. Okay, so diversity. Um, it is very important uh, to consider diversity uh, as a leader, obviously, and uh, through my time at Boeing, I have, uh, I have seen the, the approach to diversity um, evolving and I'm really pleased to see how the uh, how it has evolved. Um, I may say that I've observed two different styles styles on diversity. One is uh, a descriptive style, and the other is actionable. So what what I mean when I say descriptive is like the traditional view that we have about diversity. It's you know training about gender differences, age, natural national origin, etc. Um, and this training has focuses more on understanding how are we different, and if we understand how we're different, we can work better together, which is good, and I think it's an important element. And I think it's, it's very good to continue to use it in organizations because it supports team morale, it brings that occasional potluck, we get to learn about other cultures, have fun enjoying food. Um, 
And that's one element. But um, in the last five to six years, uh, Boeing has been uh, um, including as part of the diversity approach to to um, to have a more actionable um, element on it. So what I mean with actionable is uh, it's not only understanding the differences, but understanding how do we work together to leverage those differences. So if there's one name I would like you to remember from this uh, webcast is uh, Dr. Steve Robbins. Not that I have any <laughs> business relationship with him, but he's, uh, uh, we, we had the opportunity to listen to him in one of the Boeing uh, diversity events, and his message was very powerful. Um, it was, uh, I would say, very engineering oriented because he, he strives to look what is the cause and effect of the way we behave. Uh, and uh, how do we success or not success on that behavior when it comes to diversity? So um, not gonna try to explain it in his in for, for him. There's a lot of uh, good um, web material, but uh, his main fo his main focus is practicing inclusion, to be open-minded and to avoid what he calls unintentional tolerance. That sometimes happens. We are not aware that we are not acting in a tolerant way because uh, of cultural aspects. Um, so for me, for me, um, uh, the way I apply it at work, and uh, uh, every time we have like a workshop in which a group of people are going to, a uh, multifunctional team is going to get together and try to resolve an, um, a problem. Um, if I have the opportunity to do the opening comments for an, uh, for a workshop, I always uh, um, uh, encourage the team to be to be able to practice that inclusion. So that means investing the time to entertain the other uh, the, the other people's ideas. To make sure that uh, we are listening to each other. Uh, sometimes in these uh, uh, in, in these workshops, it's a very fast-paced uh, process. But uh, uh, as uh, we need to balance the need for having results, we're making sure that we uh, uh, we listen to uh, other people's alternatives. Um, and obviously, uh, an actionable. Uh, um, approach to diversity has a strong impact on the bottom line because it supports the, uh, the ability to have continuous learning and improvement. It fosters innovation. It fosters engagement and enthusiasm. So all that translates to better productivity, better products for our customers, and better bottom, bottom line. And I think there's research available that proves that companies that effectively um, uh, leverage diversity uh, have a have a better uh, place in the competitive market marketplace. Okay, career management. Um, I think this is a summary of some of the uh, items that I have already uh, explained uh, through this presentation. Um, if you're curious to know more about the the map that I have in a in the slide, it's actually a Jefferson map, which is um, a Boeing company product, and um, it is actually from Timbuktu. Uh, I thought it was kind of a, it had a very nice geographical uh, uh, distribution that mapped very well to my manufacturing, customer service, and engineering path. So following the theme of, theme of uh, um, uh, the aerospace, um, in through this, through this path, it's been very important for me to continue to follow my passion, but also balance it to, with the listening to advice and what's good for my career. Um, also, early in my career, because I worked for a light signal before, I had an understanding about what is working for a big corporation. And I think that's very important for everybody that wants to get into a big industry to make that reality check if that's something that you have a, you have a passion for because it comes with pros and cons, you know. Uh, the pros is that you get to be in a project, in a very big project, be part of, be, of something very important for the world. The cons, well, that there could be some bureaucracy. Things may not move as fast-paced as, as um, dot .com. But um, so, for, so having that awareness has really helped me to continue to have the passion for my work. Um, I already mentioned it's very important to have many mentors. Um, when it comes to networking, um, that's one of the areas that I, I continue to work for because it's very easy for me to, to develop my network based on achievement and meaningful experiences. You know, the network is built based on the work. 
and um, but there's also the other networking element about more like more of the social aspect, um, the after our after our drinks and all that. Um, early in my career, also moving across different realms uh, has really helped me. The beginning, it, it was I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's really hard to move from one realm to another, and uh, it, it requires great effort to be able to assimilate. Um, a complete new organization, new product, new social structure. But uh, um, at this point, uh, I, I'm starting to see how um, doing that has it, it has provided me a leverage that, uh, competitive-wise, with other with other individuals on my same uh, career um, situation, I, I have a leverage. Um, so um, it is not that common that people move around to or many many realms. That you know, the rotational program has really helped me with that. And obviously, uh, continuously seeking for meaningful training. I wanted to mention some training that has been uh, crucial on my development, which is when I got into the technical side, and I wanted to make sure I understood all the lingo, especially the stress design language, lingo. So I took uh, classes in aircraft structures. And when it comes to leadership, uh, there is a great class that is provided for uh, uh, women in technical leadership in the Smith College. I highly recommend that. And also, you know, the internal training at Boeing and leadership. Uh, I mentioned before the engineering leadership program. There's also the first line level, second level in Boeing training that it's imparted in the Boeing Leadership Center, which is a very nice uh, kind of a retreat place where uh, managers go and take, um, you know, classes like a week or two weeks at a time. Um, also, uh, uh, it, 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 I just Completed, completed a certificate on Spanish leadership, and that was also a great class because it was not only about uh, uh, how to uh, leverage your cultural elements uh, to strengthen corporate America, but also about um, working with uh, um, other organizations as nonprofits to and hone our leadership, leadership in a different realm. Okay. All right, uh, so the current tactics. Uh, uh, before I mention that, uh, yeah, I wanted to explain later on um, what was my change in, uh, in, why did I change from the IRC, you know, the fabrication senior manager, to back to structures. Um, so basically one of the things that I have learned and I actually chatted with other LGO members is um, what are, you know, the best parameters or what are the best uh, um, uh, the, the best way to transition from one assignment to another in such a complex environment as the, as the Boeing company. Um, so um, in my transition from uh, being a first-line manager to the fab job, um, I changed, uh, when I changed the jobs, I actually changed what I'm, I, I'm calling on the slide, like three of the, uh, of, uh, three, of the three flight axes. So when you are in your career, there's three axes that we are considering. This is kind of an, uh, an, uh, an analogy to, to flight versus you know, career changes. Uh, there's three main levels, which are uh, if you're changing to a new assignment, you're changing to a new job level, like from first level to second level. Then there's another element, which is you're changing to a new network. The network could be a, a different group of folks you haven't worked with before, and, they, and you have to establish all those relationships and reports. And then there's the other element, which is uh, um, transitioning to a, 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 a responsibility with a different product, which is, you know, from, seven for, uh, from 1047 to 777, from uh, um, doing a structures work to interiors work. So um, when I did the transition from interiors to structures, I basically changed all my flight access, so it was very hard to navigate. And I'm very grateful of, of the, the opportunity, and I, I think I got the most out of it. And there was a lot of uh, uh, project management that I also, learned, I, also learned, uh, I also learned during that opportunity. But the, the lesson is, like, as we move on our careers, uh, we need to be mindful about how many axes we move because uh, it, it, could le it could lead to some turbulence. Um, again, in my current taxes to, to chart the future. So as you see, I have a new chart in here with a lot of, um, you know, question marks, what will be the next move? 
And uh, the important part in here is not necessarily to have a path very well defined, but to know, you know, what's your realm? What's, what, are, what, is the, what are the areas that you continue to be interested, uh, continue, to, uh, continue to look inwards and see where is my passion? So I chart the, 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 the areas I'm passionate about, and then um, the next step is to continue to understand how the organization evolves, what the opportunities are, and try to find a match between my passion and, and, and the opportunities available. Um, other tactics, continue to network through social settings and uh, continue to learn and evolve my leadership staff. Okay, and last but not least, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because, uh, on this slide because this is basically uh, a, a list of the most relevant, relevant classes that I took in LGO. So, um, in analogy again, I think uh, we had a very good flight back that was established uh, by uh, going to, uh, to MIT. And, um, you know, the, the top classes that I could think of that have helped me so much on my career are basically um, systems thinking, operations management, uh, that business acumen that you get from the MBA. Uh, that's especially good uh, when you're working with change and uh, helping teams to understand um, <clears throat> the company direction. I always use my MBA tools to explain uh, our organization, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, organization leadership and change, obviously, is a very important one. Um, and uh, another important lesson learned from uh, MIT is when I took the class on manufacturing uh, and lean manufacturing, um, uh, I remember very well that uh, um, it was very important to understand the lean tools, but it's more important to understand what is the problem that we're trying to solve and make sure that we focus on the problem as we use the tools. So that's been something that I ha it's been of great help uh, as I make decisions and continuous improvement in my career. And obviously other classes like supply chain, mechanical assembly, product design, all of them are of great support. And, uh, and obviously, and last but not least, you know, top-notch peers. Um, and the, the support network that we have in here at Boeing is fantastic. Um, actually, uh, I want to thank Juan Nguyen because he helped me put in together this presentation and make it, uh, he helped me make it more uh, focused and lively, and I really appreciate his help. So uh, there's, um, there is a great deal of support here at Boeing because we are a very group now, very a big group now. We are about uh, 50 plus. Okay, so I think I went over a little bit, but I'm I'm ready for Q and A. Okay, thanks so much, Victoria. Um, anyone who uh, would like to make a comment, please. Uh, I think you can unmute yourselves and. Um, just chime in. If you'd like, you can also send me a chat. Uh, I've got a question for Vicky. So, you know, oftentimes... Uh, is that Jeff? Can you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. This is actually Quang. I'm in the uh, room with Vicky. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I just always find it um, interesting, you know, um, as you mature and, um, you know, continue to develop and learn more, you know, I, leadership styles change. Can you comment on how, you know, your leadership style has changed when you first came in to Boeing until what it is now as you've blossomed into a leader? <laughs> Thank you very much, Juan, for the question. Um, well, um, when I joined uh, LGO, I was... Uh, my assignments, my prior assignments were, um, I had a little bit of management experience uh, with quality assurance supervisors, and, uh, but uh, a lot of my uh, um, experience was uh, like a individual contributor and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, working in my little realms of quality assurance, manufacturing engineer. Um, after graduating from uh, LGO, um, all these classes in regards to system thinking, operations management, really opened my mind to see beyond just uh, um, <clears throat> the current processes that I was assigned to, uh, um, seeing uh, you know that, it, that there is a bigger picture and that um, and 
that uh, there's a lot of questions to ask and a lot of a lot to learn to be able to see the problems in a more systemic way rather than just in a discrete uh, um, discrete way. That was one element, you know. I think for uh, that would be my answer number one: systems thinking. Um, uh, the other element that I have that I have grown to a lot is uh, the inspirational side of my leadership style. Um, before LGU and before working for uh, the Boeing company, I was a little bit more dry. It was like engineering style, just go and get things done. And and um, but um, after um, all the learnings I have had at this time, um, I have a better ability to uh, inspire my team to uh, use a language that is more uh, inspirational in regards to seeing the future, seeing how much can we accomplish, and uh, and uh, being able to uh, help the, the team succeed, you know, building that confidence, being, building that uh, more positive and optimistic uh, ambience for my groups. That will be the main two. So. Hi, um, this is Carolyn Freeman. I'm in the in the room with Jeff, and um, uh, I'm a first year LGO, and uh, used to work at Boeing actually before I came here. Um, one of the uh, one of the questions I had was, um, I I've heard I've talked to a few other LGO grads about the rotational program, um, and I just wanted to ask you, how, what was your relationship like with your mentor? And because um, I've heard both positive and negative experiences? Yeah, great question, Caroline. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, the mental relationships are, uh, um, it's, it's very interesting because uh, in the rotational, uh, during the rotational program, we get an assigned mentor, right? So uh, it is kind of like a lottery, right? You get assigned to an individual and um, uh, most of the times, it'll be a good match, and there could be some occasions in which the the match is 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 not as um, optimal. And in my particular experience, I uh, I working with Ross Bog uh, was a very good experience, and and, and um, get to learn a lot from him. And um, and as I said before. Um, even though we have assigned mentors, we also have the flexibility to uh, look for other mentors if uh, the relationship that we're building with that specific assigned uh, one is not working very well. So um, I don't know if this answers your question very well, but I, I think the benefit that we can just expand, and because we are part of the LGO network, um, uh, we can use that as a leverage to develop more relationships with other leaders. Um, uh, that I think that kind of uh, helps you know mitigate an, an issue like that. So, I don't know if that fully answers your question. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thank you. Okay, I, I don't know if we're going to start losing our audience because it's the top of the hour, but I just want to thank Victoria so much for your time on this call, and thanks to those for sitting in and for asking questions. Um, please uh, refer back to the MIT Tech TV website, where LGO has a collection of its videos that include archived videos of these web seminars, and this one should be up within the week uh, so that uh, maybe we could share the value of this experience with others at our institutions or companies. So again, thanks a lot, Victoria. Thanks also to you, Kwong, for your help. And I hope you have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much, Josh.